Good evening. Welcome to California Today. I'm Liang Zhang. Here's a preview of some of today's stories. Members of the Taiwanese community in Southern California held a memorial for the victims of the church shooting earlier this month. They honored the doctor who many say sacrificed his life to save others. The ongoing FBI corruption probe has led to one California Democratic Party member resigning from her post. Her resignation comes after her own party called for her to leave her position. And in a special report from California insiders Sarah Mac Karami, we'll show you what's really making the state's gas so expensive. One week after the mass shooting at a Taiwanese church, the community gathered to mourn the victims. They also honored the doctor who was killed while he tried to stop the shooter. Members of the Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church and leaders of the Taiwanese American community gathered to mourn on Saturday. They honored the victims of the May 15th mass shooting that killed one and injured five. They stood in silence for one minute in front of a display of flowers in memory of 52-year-old Dr. John Chang. He was a local physician who was shot to death after what people are calling a selfless heroic act that likely saved many lives at the mass shooting. We have an outreach to Dr. Chen's mom and the family. And we need to put more some effort to express our love. But meanwhile, we try to keep them away, away from the public eyes. We want to keep them as quiet as possible and as peace as possible. Officials said Dr. Chang was killed when he charged at and attempted to disarm the gunman, 68-year-old David Wenwei Cho of Las Vegas. After Dr. Chang collapsed, Cho's weapon seemed to jam. Pastor Billy Chang then struck the gunman with a chair, and others pressed him down and hogtied him with electrical cords before law enforcement arrived. Authorities said Cho was motivated by a grievance against the Taiwanese community over Taiwan's political tensions with China. We hope we can respect others' different beliefs, different backgrounds, and culture for a better life in the United States. We should strive to work together towards a common future. So I wanted to come here as soon as I can to embrace my friends and extend my warm regards and condolences to the family of Dr. Chen and also my friends that are attending ITPC and to my friends in the Taiwanese American community that I'm here for you. The Epic Times reported that Cho was once a member of a U.S.-based Chinese Communist Party controlled group. Before the tragic event, Cho reportedly mailed stacks of handwritten letters, a diary to a Chinese language newspaper's office. Initial reports said Cho was Chinese. Investigators later determined he was born and raised in Taiwan and later moved to the United States. Authorities charged Cho with 10 counts, which include first-degree murder, attempted murder, and possession of other weapons. An official in the California Democratic Party resigned from her positions over the weekend. Her resignation comes after revelations that the FBI previously arrested her on bribery charges. A multi-year FBI investigation in Anaheim is gradually revealing a network of individuals suspected of corruption. Malahat Rafi'i, the secretary of the California Democratic Party, resigned from her position on Sunday. She wrote on Twitter that she never attempted to improperly influence any elected official and the work she undertook to root out corruption was in the best interest of the people of this state. A criminal complaint in May alleges that a cooperating witness with the FBI was involved in planning bribery schemes in Irvine and Anaheim. Rafi'i confirmed she was the cooperating witness. In 2019, Rafi'i was arrested by the FBI on suspicion of bribery. Democratic Party leadership, including the California Democratic Progressive Caucus, called for her resignation. The investigation led to the arrest of Todd Ament, former head of the Anaheim Chamber of Commerce. The FBI is still investigating Anaheim Mayor Harry Sidhu on suspicion of corruption. But the Bureau has not yet named a political consultant who is part of the described cabal of people influencing politics in the city. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. Ever wondered why gas prices are so high? California Insider's Sarah Mac Karami has a special visual explainer on why it costs so much to fill up in the Golden State. 
Do you ever wonder why California's gas prices cost so much higher than the national average? Look at this chart. You'll see the gap between California's gas prices, which is the top line, and the national average, the bottom one. It's easy to notice the gap is getting bigger and bigger. Now the prices are 37% higher than the national average. For most California drivers, that's about $900 more a year on gas. People may chalk it up as being a sunshine tax, that everything in California is just more expensive. But there are actually a number of reasons why gas has gotten so expensive. In 1992, due to severe pollution from smog, California implemented a special blend of gas for the state to cut down on emissions that cause air pollution, such as sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and other chemicals. This special blend helps the environment, but makes our supply more limited since only refineries in our state produce it. This limited supply could easily lead to higher prices. In 2013, the cap and trade program was implemented with an intentional goal to drive up the gas prices by 24 to 73 cents over 18 years. The plan was to encourage people to reconsider their consumption of products with carbon emissions. Under this plan, businesses will get a yearly allowance of greenhouse gas emissions that are within the budget specified by the Air Resources Board. If companies don't reduce their emissions, they will have to buy extra allowances from other companies. And this added extra costs for California refineries. In 2015, the Air Resources Board implemented the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which essentially created a score system for fuels based on carbon emission. The standard gets stricter every year. The companies that make the benchmark can generate credit, whereas the ones who don't meet the benchmark will be required to pay the penalty for their extra carbon emission. This sounds good in theory, and it would be great for the environment, but in the end, it's the consumers who pay. According to studies, this adds anywhere from 30 cents to $1.06 per gallon. As a result of all these laws, the number of refineries have dropped significantly over the last few decades. In 1992, we had 29 refineries, and now we only have 14 refineries left. As a result of so many regulations, refineries couldn't keep up, so most closed or switched to producing diesel instead, which further reduced our capacity to create our special gas. On top of that, only two other refineries in the world one located in Canada and one in South Korea are able to produce our reformulated gas. But shipping it here is costly, and ultimately the consumers will be paying for it. Despite California having oil, especially in Kern County, over the years many regulations and lawsuits caused our domestic oil wells to be capped, slowly decreasing our crude oil supply. As an effect, refineries are being pushed to import more. As far as records show, California has steadily increased import from foreign countries. Just last year, we had over 56% of our oil imported, which just means more money that as we consumers will pay. Though these policies and regulations were created with good intentions, it seems that they have tag team and morphed into a giant monster, making the gas prices higher. If you're well off, the difference might not be much to you. But for people with low income, this creates an unsustainable burden. The average commuter drives 50 miles per day, so the price of gas can really add up, especially if you cannot afford an electric car. Thank you for watching this video. We visualize the most pressing issues that California is facing by using simple explanation and impactful animation so that you can be better informed. If you like our content, please subscribe to our channel. See you next time. We're going to take a short break, but here's a look at what we got for you when we come back. Not only are there less teachers in California, but now it seems there are also less public school students. We'll look at which major districts are looking low on numbers. In a herring rescue, a helicopter lifted a man from an oceanside cliff on the San Francisco Peninsula. We have the video of the death-defying rescue. In a very different mood in the Bay Area, a bizarre festival was held over the weekend.
We'll look at which traditional culture was on display, from fresh food to beautiful dance. That and more on California Today. Two major Southern California school districts are facing declining enrollment. One of the districts is calling for an increase in funding, while a union in the other is calling for increase to pay to teachers. Several major California school districts may be facing decreased funding as student enrollment numbers drop in public education. One of Orange County's largest school districts, the Capistrano Unified School District, is calling on the state to increase school funding as it faces declining enrollment. According to officials at a meeting last week, the district's projected enrollment is expected to drop by over 800 students for the coming school year. Capistrano Unified board member Gila Jones called the proposed budget a starvation budget, saying besides the most basic needs, there isn't any extra money. That's because public school funding is based on student attendance. The district board spoke in favor of Assembly Bill 1614, which would increase base public school funding. Neighboring Los Angeles Unified, one of the largest districts in the nation, expects its enrollment to drop by 30% in the next 10 years. The decrease may result in campus closures throughout the district. Meanwhile, the teachers' union is seeking a salary increase in the next two years, citing the high cost of living in California. The LAUSD school board will face the tough decision of whether to close or downsize schools. Statewide teacher shortages are also affecting the school, along with its COVID jab mandate. San Francisco's mayor announced that she will not be joining this year's Pride Parade. This is after the parade decided to ban uniform the police officers from participating. On Monday, Mayor London Breed said she will not march in the San Francisco Pride Parade on June 26. Her reason is the parade's organizers are banning uniformed police officers from joining. In a statement to the San Francisco Standard, Breed said that she made this very hard decision in order to support members of the LGBTQ community who serve in uniform and those who serve to march to support their partners. Breed hopes the organizers will change their policy. In a news release, the San Francisco Police Department said they are committed to not only serving the diverse communities of San Francisco, but to embracing the diversity of our members. Although they won't be marching in the parade, they will be present to ensure that everyone is safe. Members of the Sheriff's Office and Fire Department will also not participate in the parade. A law enforcement helicopter rescued a man stranded on a cliff wall south of San Francisco. It's not yet clear how the man got there, but the rescue was all caught on camera. NTD's Aining Ang reports. A California Highway Patrol helicopter rescued a man stuck on a steep cliff at Muscle Rock in Daly City last Thursday. A local fisherman spotted him clinging on about halfway down a 500-foot cliff and called the Daly City Fire Department. Rescuers on the ground weren't able to locate him due to his location, so the CHP helicopter flew in. The pilot hovered at 100 feet while a rescuer hoisted down another rescuer to the man. Unfortunately for this call, we were kind of battling some strong winds, about 30 to 40 knots, so we knew that was going to be a factor. Um, but my team did a really good job in kind of positioning me to where the, uh, the victim was. They put the man in a harness and moved to a nearby landing zone. There, he was transferred to medical personnel. CHP helicopters are fully equipped for advanced life support transports and always have a paramedic on board. The man was taken to a hospital with some scrapes and bruises. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Railroads and trains play a major part in making the supply chain go round, but they're also the cause of many unwanted sounds. One city in Silicon Valley is trying to make residents who live near railroads a little less noisy. We'll hear more from NTD's David Lamb. Some residents living near the Union Pacific or UP Railway have gotten used to the blaring horns from trains, but for others, the high-powered horns outside their windows at midnight is too much to bear. In response, on Friday, May 20th, San Jose officials celebrated the start of a partial quiet zone along the Union Pacific Railroad. The section runs through San Jose and the restriction began earlier this month. 
I'm really honored to be joined by community leaders and elected officials as we together celebrate uh, the implementation of our nighttime quiet zone here in Japantown and throughout this corridor. A partial quiet zone means that train operators will not blow their horns as trains approach crossings between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., except in emergency situations. Really, it was because of their advocacy in 2019 uh, that we heard that there were serious concerns about UP operations at night that are preventing anyone from getting a decent night's sleep. And I think some justifiable and appropriate crankiness was in order. And we heard it loud and clear. And I say, Licardo said thousands of residents were disturbed in their sleep every night by the Union Pacific train operations due to a change in routing. Warm Springs, Japantown, Hensley residents have long endured the inconvenience and grief caused by Union Pacific Railroad's change in operating hours, subjecting them to uh, horn noise levels between 96 and 110 decibels. And to paint a better picture, that's the equivalent to the sound of a jet taking off or a nearby rock concert. Licardo said State Assemblyman Ash Kalra secured $8 million for permanent installation along the corridor. Now, we know that Union Pacific and the trains that come through, their top priority is safety. And so you had a conflict in different priorities of a, of a peaceful, quiet neighborhood with more and more residents moving in and trains that have to keep on rolling. Crews installed striping, signs, plastic posts and humps on the pavement along the corridor. I think today is really a historic moment um, after these three years of not being able to sleep uh, throughout the night. Resident Christopher Wemp said horns can blare about two to three times throughout the night. We actually know because we uh, sometimes held out uh, decibel counters just out of curiosity. So, I mean, this is <laughs> nerd time, I guess, to do that. Wemp says he now has peace of mind and is hopeful to hear more sound news as the community wants to eventually have a 24-hour quiet zone established. David Lamb, Entity News, California. All things Indonesian, including food, dance, fashion, literature, groceries, and more were all on display at the Indonesian Bazaar in San Francisco. Friends of Indonesia hosted the event to introduce more people in the Bay Area to the culture. NTD's Jason Blair brings us more. Friends of Indonesia hosted its first Indonesian Bazaar in San Francisco on Saturday. The event was part of the city's Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month festivities. So I would love people to be introduced to Indonesia and to know Indonesian culture better, to taste our food. Along with authentic food, the event had traditional dance, fashion, plenty of good vibes and a sold-out crowd. I love my country um, and it's the fourth largest country in the whole wide world. Indonesia is not widely represented. We are still a little bit underground, but we are starting to make more noise and hopefully people have more demand on our product, our food, our goods. And hopefully Indonesia can create successful businesses. The Consulate General of the Republic of Indonesia was also in attendance. The bazaar featured many local food vendors like Nusa, who specializes in Indonesian sweets, one being klepon, which is a sweet rice cake ball filled with Indonesian palm sugar and is commonly sold as a street food. This is a very popular dish, uh, originally from the, uh, the Java Island. So I call it like a Javanese mochi. <laughs> The bazaar had entertainment featuring traditional dance performances and costumes. One dancer shared some insight into some of the deeper meaning in the movements. Bring a lot of motion from inside of this area. They consider this area connected where the bridge of heaven meets earth. And there's a lot in the culture of Sundanese talking about this meeting of heaven and earth. In Panjak Silite, you're always kind of lower where those two bridge and coming from movements and returning back down to that middle area, really representing the upper realms of the spirit and the lower realms of the earth. Our culture in America is so young, so these ancient traditions in this field are really the direction forward in the way. Friends of Indonesia plans on hosting more similar events like this in the future to share Indonesian cuisine and culture with the San Francisco area and beyond. 
Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. Now to NTD's Thomas Christian for an update on sports. I'm Thomas Christian giving you the California Today Sports Roundup. After four quarters of closely contested basketball in Dallas, Texas, the Warriors walked out of Game 3 of their Western Conference Finals matchup against the Mavericks unscathed. Leaning heavily on Stephen Curry and Andrew Wiggins to score in this one, Golden State executed an excellent game plan by head coach Steve Kerr. First half was closely contested though, with both sides failing to effectively shoot the rock as the two offenses sputtered. But the Warriors came out at halftime swinging, turning their one-point halftime lead to 10 by the end the quarter. The Mavericks never led in the second half. The Mavericks' Luka Doncic led all scorers with 40 points. The Warriors' game plan on defense so far has been to make life hard on Luka but prioritize his other teammates and to make sure that none of them get hot. Jalen Brunson scored 20 and Spencer Dinwiddie added 26 for the Mavericks but the rest of Dallas combined for just 14 points altogether. Without meaningful contributions from other players, Luka can score as many points as he wants, but will end up tiring himself out and will be unable to close the gap all by himself. It was this game plan that has seen the Warriors take a 3-0 lead in the series, needing only one more win to seal a trip back to the NBA Finals. Klay Thompson scored 19 points on some rocky shooting for the Warriors, and Jordan Poole and Draymond Green each added 10 points. The Warriors and Mavs will play again in Dallas on Tuesday. The winner of this series plays the winner of the Miami Heat and Boston Celtic matchup in the Eastern Conference Final. Mavericks 100, Warriors 109. Manny Machado had four extra base hits in a game for the first time in his career, and a rookie left-hander Mackenzie Gore held the Giants to one run on three hits over six innings as the San Diego Padres routed the Giants 10-1 on Sunday. Padres scored their first series sweep in San Francisco since 2016 after winning one-run games on Friday and Saturday. Machado, who leads the National League in hitting with a .374 average, had three doubles and a triple in four at-bats. He drove in two runs and scored three. Will Myers had three hits, including a double and three RBIs for the Padres. Giants won, Padres 10. Garrett Stubbs and Roman Quick scored on a fielding error by second baseman Max Muncy in the bottom of the 10th inning, giving Philadelphia a win over visiting Los Angeles. The win ended Philly's three-game losing streak and prevented the Dodgers from extending their seven-game winning streak. Phillies four, Dodgers three. Patrick Sandoval gave up one run on seven and a third innings. Shohei Otani and Mike Trout homered and host Los Angeles beat Oakland in Anaheim, California. Sandoval gave up four hits, walked one, and struck out seven while making 92 pitches. Angels reliever Ryan Tapera got two strikeouts to finish the eighth inning, and Rysiel Iglesias struck out the side in the ninth for his tenth save. Trout led the Angels offense with his team leading 12th homer of the year with a single, double, walk, two RBIs, and two runs scored. Angels four, Athletics one. And that's all for sports. And that's all for tonight. You can join us again on California Today every weekday at 8.30 p.m. If you have any news tips or ideas for our show or just want to let us know how we're doing, our email is california.today at ntd.com. I'm Lane Zhang. We'll see you next time.